Thank you. I've never gotten a round of applause before. Um, so let's dive right in. Um, I'm David. That's me. I'm a senior designer at Makers and Allies, like she just said. And I'm super excited to be here to talk to you guys about brand design. And I, <laughs> and I hope that you guys are just as excited as Napoleon, because that's how I feel right now. Okay. So just a little kind of agenda for today. I'll go through a little bit about myself, um, a little bit about Makers and Allies. We'll get to the fun stuff, with the projects, and then at the end we'll have some time to you guys can ask questions, talk about whatever, um, pick my brain. Um, but yeah, basically the meat of the presentation is going to be projects, which I have samples here that I'll pass around as we go through each one. So a little about myself. This is my life in a nutshell. I enjoy food. I enjoy grilling meats. And I enjoy whiskey. And then most recently, kimchi, which is my husky that I adopted three weeks ago. Um, he looks cute in that picture. He's the devil. He does not listen. He's not trained. And that's kind of on my part, but still love him. Um, and, you know, through, I've been cooking my whole life since I was a kid. Um, and through that, as I got older, I just kind of naturally went into liking whiskeys to pair with the food I was eating. And that kind of led me to the makers team. Um, and so a big other part of my life is the people that I work with because I spend um, pretty much all my time at the office and you know when you work with great people and have a great culture it's it kind of makes for the job to be pretty easy and so mm -hmm. kind of uh, in the top left it's me and Sarah our creative director in Iowa taking a photo sh having a photo shoot in the cornfields um, on the right of that we have a single fin Friday that we have um, where we have to wake up at like 8 o'clock in the morning to go surf and I obviously didn't do that I sat down and ate donuts the whole time. <laughs> and then the bottom we have our most recent Halloween. Um, I don't get the theme. It was supposed to be shiny. So a lot of people are shiny. And I don't know if you can tell which one I am. I am uh, this guy in the red sequin diaper <laughs> with <laughs> eyes plastered all over my face. So <laughs> I don't know how that's shiny, but it was. Um, so this kind of leads me into Makers and Allies. Uh, we'll kind of go through who we are. Mm -hmm. Makers and Allies is an award-winning design and branding studio producing exclusively for the wine, craft, and spirits mm -hmm. industry. Um, those three areas are really our core of what we do. They're bread and butter, but we also do um, kind of branch out into kind of craft foods, um, well products, but they kind of always have to match our core kind of areas of expertise. Uh, we believe in bringing brands to life through rich stories, unique packaging, and and the four main services we offer are branding, packaging, digital, and activation, which I'll kind of go into a little detail later. Some of our work can be found on these publications and retailers. Um, we've been lucky enough to have an awesome team that makes really cool work, and it gets noticed, which is always great. Um, and it's just a ch another chance for us to share our work with the hard work that we put into it. This is our team. Um, you can see Dante Quarante on the top left. He's got three little Frenchies in his photo. <laughs> He's an awesome guy. But um, yeah, it's cool to see this kind of photo laid out where when I first started about five years ago, it was just three of us in a little rented space in a warehouse. And now we have almost 20 people um, with a nice office in downtown. And I don't know if some of you professors recognize uh, Mr. Sterling. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, yep. Sterling. Uh, we just recently hired him, senior designer. Uh, Robert still works with us for support because he's a web wizard. He really is a wizard. He looks like one. He does, yeah. <laughs> and with all these people on our team, what really kind of holds us all together are these two phrases, like words that we kind of live by, craftsmanship and camaraderie. Um, it's very synonymous to our name, Makers and Allies. Uh, what this really means is just, we put the care and effort into what we do, but then also building those relationships with our clients, but also with team members inside the office. And we kind of visually show that in our, in our monogram with the ampersand kind of linking the M&A together. Um, 
and we're kind of the, the glue that holds it all together. Lottery, we kind of go about our day to day by these three kind of pillars, we like to call them. Um, stand out, stand for something, and details are everything. Um, these aren't just cool words or phrases that you know we thought sounded nice to put in our branding or our marketing, but they really are things that we really stand for. Um, and we try to remind ourselves every day that you know these are these are things that not only apply to packaging or design, but you know, kind of a human being too. Um, and through that, we're able to create brands that have a pulse. Um, you can see a lot of, this is kind of shows our breadth of the stuff we do. This is all of our own photography. We do um, styled shoots, we do outdoor shoots, um, lifestyle products. Um, an awesome contractor who's uh, based out in Oregon and he does videography. And so we're lucky to have a really cool team that can have all these different talents and we all come together. And so kind of touching back on the four services we have, um, branding, packaging, digital, and activation. Um, today we're just going to be focusing on the packaging aspect of what we do, and more specifically brand design, which is kind of, I have to see it as a little subset within packaging, because there's so much more than just uh, making a nice label for a package. It's kind of all about creating the world around it um, and building that universe. And so I won't really go through this paragraph. Um, but you can kind of see what we offer. And so now stuff. Does anybody know what mezcal is? <laughs> so if you don't, um, I like to call it the cousin of tequila. So here's a photo of, I forgot what exact, what exact species of agave that is, but, um, Mezcal can be produced from any type of agave, uh, whereas tequila has to be the Weber or the blue agave. Um, and so a lot of the mezcals that you'll see are wildly har grown and harvested. Like this guy is literally in the mountains. Um, he's not in a farm anywhere. And so we were lucky enough to work with a client and I'll pass these out as I'm talking through these. Careful of the cork top, they are loose. If you flip it over, they might spill on you, so I don't want these to spill on you. You can pass them around. You said it, is water, so. it is water, so don't try to drink it. <laughs> it's been it's been yeah. sitting there for a while. So Serafico Mezcal, um, they came to us uh, wanting to create a new brand, or it was an existing brand, but it wasn't really going anywhere in, sh in stores. Um, they really wanted to bring it to life, tell a story, and kind of create something interesting. And so um, the bigger thing about this project is we wanted to tell the story of Mezcal, but um, in a little bit more fanciful, mystical kind of way. Um, and that's where all the imagery kind of comes in. I'll talk about that as I go through each one. So. This little critter you see on the label, he's based off the green lion of alchemy. Um, and we kind of took that concept and repurposed it. Um, and so you can see on his body, there's a lot of symbolism. On his body, he has seven stars. He's holding the moon and the star. And the stars. And he's got two tails, one of them like, representing the burning pinas of the agave, and the other one when they're cut and all the leaves are cut off. Um, and just kind of, he looks a little goofy. I'll admit that. His face is a little funny. Um, but I think it kind of adds to that. Um, I don't know if you guys know Posada. He's uh, very uh, good at this art style where he does these wood carvings. And so, you know, inspired by that, we went in and custom illustrated all this. And for all you print geeks out there, you can see the embossing and the foil on the logo. You can kind of see a little bit of the deboss on the Echo in Mexico. Um, and for the next one, we're just kind of going down the package, and you guys will see it in hand also, but um, each varietal has a different strip on the bottom, and the focus on each um, agave species, bottle number, the date it was bottled, and the master distill. So, um, the thing about this brand is that it's not made in the factory or in a warehouse. Um, and so all the jobs go back to the village. Um, all the proceeds go back to them to just continue to keep making this product because
because it is a, as you saw in the photo before, it's not an easy job to harvest these agaves. And on the image on the left, I don't know if you can see that, but um, just another fun way to show our work is with the styled shoots that we do in the studio. And so we have a whole series of those, but this one is showing the kind of the tasting notes of this specific agave. So you've got cinnamon and lime and cloves and a bunch of other spices in there. Last one, just another side detail of the strip. And then you can see on the necks of them all, they all have a little band with a little rope on it. You can untie that if you want. Uh, but each one has a tasting note section and just more information about that agave. Um, it's a pain in the ass for production, but we wanted it. Uh, does anyone have any questions right now? I want to. We have three projects I'm going to look at, and at the end, I kind of want to just to maybe a few minutes of questions if anyone had any questions. Yes. Yeah, and they're all hand handwritten. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we for sure listen to the client as to <clears throat> what story they want to tell and what they want to do. But um, the cool thing that about makers that we've been able to accomplish over the past few years is people come to us because they trust us to show the best style for their brand. And you know sometimes it might not be right, but that's why you show it uh, versions or iterations in that first review. Um, for this, I'm sure we had. One that was like tattoo inspired. One was more like a full, like almost like a woodcut plate. And then this was the last one. And so we do explore a lot of variations, but those variations, in our opinion, are the ones that fit this brand of the story. So yeah, we don't really have one style, but we try to just listen to the client, see what makes the most sense. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, this one, man, this one was too long. This should have been, I think, six months. It was almost a year and a half. So, but that's what happens when you work with a product that's always changing. You never know. It's not made the same way all the time. You don't know how many agave you can get. You don't know how many. It was just, it was a new experience, but yeah, it lasted a lot longer than we wanted. We're just gonna people in your team are like kind of the jack, like each of them are jack of all trades, or like they, they know everything about design, or um, are some people like specializing in illustration, some in branding, some. Like Before when our team was smaller, we all kind of had to do everything. Um, but now as the team's grown, we have a lot of team members that, we have one, Hannah, who's just an amazing watercolor illustrator and like pencil sketch illustrator. Um, there's another one who's really good at carving wood blocks. Um, so now that our team's more diverse, we kind of have those little specialty people. Um, so it's been a lot nicer now that we don't all have to try to do the same style. Do they tell you the bottle they want to use, or is it, is it kind of chicken and egg bottle so, first? So this one, the client had this bottle in mind, um, and they really wanted it. And I think it was just because they um, purchased a large order of it before. So they, <laughs> they didn't want to waste their money. Um, but a lot of our clients, when we start a project, will we'll suggest bottles that we think fit the price, fit the look, the market, and the competitive set of who else is out there. So when we, when we can, we always try to make sure the client you know, buys the nicest, heaviest glass, especially for wine. Yes, I'll go and come back to you. services go all the way from design through printing? Mm-hmm. We do. We try our best to go to press checks and bottling dates. Um, for those that are in California, we try our best to do that. But um, we work with such awesome clients that, like, I, I work with a production manager at one of our um, clients, and on a press check date, he'll FaceTime me and he'll take photos and be like, is this color good? Do we need more density here? So it's always nice to have people that you work closely with. But um, I wish I could be at all those press checks. Yeah. Do 
This is a completely new brand. I mean, they did have something, but I don't think it ever hit stores or even sold a bottle. Yeah. Anyone else? Moving on. Sorry, I'm just checking my time. I don't want to leave. All right. Next one is Barnacles Rum. I only have two of these, so we'll kind of go outside and then you guys can head to the middle. <clears throat> and again, this is not rum. It's, it's old coffee and water. <laughs> so you might see some floaties in there. <clears throat> it's not ew. All right. When you think of rum, you might think of someone like this, you know. You got your Captain Morgans. That's all I know. I don't know what else there is. Um, but I guess I just want to like ask the room, when you think of rum, do you think of something high quality or is it more of like a, you pound it? Pound it, yeah. And you know, this might not be the right audience. I don't know. I don't want to get you guys in trouble. Just kidding. Never mind. Never mind. But anyways, we got to work with uh, Barnacles Rum, which um, again is a spirit that we got to work on. And um, the cool thing that we got to do with this is kind of show that there's another side to rum than just your kind of mixer or whatever. And so both of these are aged, the youngest is eight years and then the oldest is 12 year. And so, um, you know, rum enthusiasts have been appreciating rum for a while, but now with the, like, kind of the craft cocktail culture getting larger, um, people are treating rums like whiskeys and scotches. And they're taking the time to um, age them, properly store them, and drink them. Um, and this brand in particular, with their sugar cane that they harvest and they use for these rums. Um, and so again, I think the coolest thing about this brand is that the client is so adamant about what they're putting into it. So that just kind of makes our job a little bit easier to care more about it and you know, tell the story the best we can. So going into some of the details of this project, um, we got the large word mark just running across the side, like, or the front like a banner. Um, and the, the thing we try to do with this label from the front, um, the areas that have the gold foil, we really wanted to draw your eye onto those specific areas. So the first thing you might see, you know, is that the sash going across the front, and then you see the medallion on the top left. Um, and then your eye kind of naturally goes to that bottom right where it has the year expression. And so a lot of times, you know, sometimes a label might just want more gold foil and you just put it on to look nice. Sometimes there is a little purpose behind it. Your kind of consumer look. But this, uh, this label was for sure the most time consuming one that I've ever worked on. Um, you can see on the labels, these are all collaged from public domain art that I had to find in the depth of the internet. I'm sure I got some weird letters looking for some of these. Um, but yeah, they're all animals um, that are local to the region and they kind of create this scene. This one got a little ocelot, some mice, an armadillo. And the eight year has a iguana, turtle, some other things on it. You guys can look. <clears throat> but yeah, um, again, this project shouldn't have taken as long as it should have, but it took a long time and that's just Again, due to the nature of the product, and then also we didn't anticipate this label, this project going in this direction, um, becoming such an art-heavy label. So that took a lot of time. And then, yeah, you can see on the backs of these, uh, we wanted to just do something different and have them apply the back label on an angle, um, just give it that little handmade touch. Any questions on this one? Yeah. This is the client's name. Yeah. So this client, they came, they had the name ready, they had the story ready, they had everything kind of ready for us. And we're like, even the bottles were like, shoot, okay. You guys did all the work. Now we just have to make art. And what yeah. kind of directions did you have? You talked about directions on the last one. 
this one. Oh shoot, what do we have for this? I'm, I'm blanking on the other ones we had. I know one was just full uh, typography, so like based off old maps. Um, but I can't remember the second one. But always show the client three ideas. Mm -hmm. Three is kind of the minimum. Sometimes as we're designing, there's always like a wild card where we're like, they might hate this or they might love it. So it's kind of, we might be kicking ourselves in the butt if we don't show them. So sometimes we show them a fourth or even a fifth. Um, we try not to do that because that's just too much at that point for the client. We don't want to distract them. So. But yeah, three is the There was a question. Yeah. Typefaces, so we use Font Explorer to house all our fonts. And we have our server set up, so we have some general like categories, like between like a script or a or whatever. But we have so many fonts that like, sometimes, and this isn't the best way to do it, but sometimes what I'll do is I'll type in barnacles, and then I'll do like a huge scroll, click, huge scroll, click, and if I like it, I'll activate it. Um, but just so, <laughs> And so don't, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> but over the time, like I, you know, there's all those fonts that like I really like, or there's made it over the years. So I'll set up my artboard and illustrator and just probably have maybe, I don't know, 60, just different fonts of barnacles, just all next to each other. And then I'll have like, maybe that in all caps. And then maybe I'll have a title case one. And then I'll have maybe a secondary font of like, just like um, rum or like something that's secondary to the brand and then just see kind of what pairs well together um, but also you got to keep in mind what the product is what the story is because I mean on the list, you wouldn't even use like a Gotham or something because it would just kind of feel out of place and so I think the cool thing with fonts is that like something between like the R like it can be curled and another one could be straight and just that small little thing can ch change the font so much and like the whole personality. That's kind of how I do it. Just don't do the scroll and click scroll. <laughs> Any other questions on this guy? Yeah. Yeah, so this is in market now. Um, the Mezcal, unfortunately, is not. They're still kind of figuring out logistics on their end. Um, but this one is in stores. Um, I don't think it's in the West Coast yet. Uh, more in the East Coast, kind of middle coast-ish. Um, <laughs> but you can you can get it online, I think. Yeah, middle coast. Thank you. The price point is like it's an eighty-dollar bottle, right? Yeah. So they'll start they'll start with the price point. Um, I think this. I think the eight years a uh, forty, and the twelve years like a sixty or something. Um, but even that, like the price point changed between the middle, like the beginning and the end, just because of what they were using and the process they were doing. So it always changes, but we always try to, because that's also like a big thing when you're designing. Like price point's a huge determining factor of how it looks and how much gold foil you want to put on it. Like if you're selling this for 15 bucks, you want to do all this, that might not make sense. If you're a large brand like Captain Morgan, that makes sense because the production numbers kind of back up and justify the price per label. So price point is very important. All right. I'm a little fast here. I should slow down. Uh, Bristol Cider is the last one I want to show you. I don't have... I'll just open this. This is actually cider, so don't drink it. <laughs> there you go. So Bristol's is here. Sorry. Bristol's is a local brand. They're in Atascadero. Um, the the owner is here. I'll pass this to. This is the box that has them all. So the owner is Neil Collins. I don't know if some of the professors know that name, but he's been a winemaker at Tablas Creek for 30 plus years. Um, he's an OG in the Paso wine region. Um, and this is just one of his side projects because um, he's from Bristol's England. Um, and before I go into more story, 
I don't know why I picked this one. It's just funny. It's Mr. T and Conan in a wheelbarrow. <laughs> So, yeah, I don't know why I picked that, but it's there. Um, yeah, so going back onto Bristol's, um, this is just one of Neil's uh, side projects. He has about two others that he does. Um, but yeah, he was born and raised in Bristol's, England, and um, he just wanted, when he came here, he just, the only ciders he could find were just sweet, um, overly sweet ciders, like uh, Crispin or Angry Orchard and all those brands. So he just, because he knew how to make wine, he just used those skills to make cider. And so um, on the backs of all these labels, I don't have any of the bottles today, but um, never sweet or always dry, never sweet is like his thing that he always wants to push because mm. his ciders are not sweet. Some of them taste like blue cheese. Some of them are unrefrigerated, unfiltered, um, uncarbonated. <laughs> and you know, that's, that's tradition. <laughs> Don't ew at that. <laughs> but yeah, so this was a rebrand. Um, they, he had a brand. Um, all the artwork in the middle, the sketches, were done by a guy that used to work for him. Um, he was this crazy kind of traveling artist guy that just happened to stop by one day and was like, hey, I'm going to do some art for you. And so did these sketches. Um, there's a room at the tasting room. It's you got to know him to go in there, but it's just this one door, probably the size of like this. It looks like a serial killer's room. It's pencil scratches on the wall, rope tying things together, piles of dirt. But this is where this guy who drew all these like hung out. And that was his like creative space. And so <laughs> he's, a, he's an interesting guy. Um, so he, he made all these art pieces for just him to use and put on labels just so he can sell them. And he came to us because he realized he needed an actual label to sell in stores and start distributing more than just locally. So um, we took those art pieces and created a system around that to see how we can um, maintain the integrity of the art, but still you know, make it less hodgepodge. Because before it was just him warping text and making it fit on this little square label he had. I was like, dude, you can't do that. No one's going to buy that. And so um, going into detail here, this green badge was actually the script and the badge was inspired from uh, the Bristol's Omnibus Company in England. And that was like the bus that he took to school, to work, wherever. Um, and that company, you know, unfortunately, stopped operating but we found that as like a it was on the little plaque the, the buses and everything so we pulled the inspiration there and then made that its own little badge and that kind of sits apart from everything else um, and then here this is what I'm passing around you have the cans and so we did the labels these guys before we did the can and so we had this whole branding system set up and he wanted to only can the original, which is kind of his flagship. And so we didn't want to obviously just copy the label and put it on the can. And so the question we asked ourselves was, how do we take this branding and turn it into something that's easily recognizable, um, kind of stands out, uh, kind of grabs it. What we did was take that little script, blow it up, take it out of its green bag. Um, and then give it its own space to live on the can. And he really wanted to make it known that this is the original. And so he say it's, we say it's the original OG, which doesn't make sense, but that's what he wanted. Um, and yeah, you can see on the boxes, like we want to do something fun. So the script kind of goes across two panels. And so whenever it's stacked in stores, you can kind of have it two cases wide and see the whole brand. And that was just kind of our strategy to have retailers give him more space. And yeah, we got another little shoot we did. It's good. Could use a little cider. So it's in stores? Yeah, you can get it at Petra or Lincoln. This one, the blue cheese? No, this is, this is normal. You could drink this. Yeah. The blue cheese one is only at the tasting room, only during certain times of the year. And like he'll bring in like a special. Um, 
it just looks like a box with a tap coming out of it. But it's, the keg is just in there warm. Some people buy it, that's why he makes it. <laughs> yes. No. Well, I guess when we were designing it, we obviously didn't want to do like that pencil and paper sketch artwork. Just because, I mean, when that goes on a shrink sleeve, it probably would not reproduce as well. Um, even on, when you look at the gold elements, you see that kind of moray pattern happening. Um, and that's, a, that's another thing we were talking about is shrink sleeve is so much more cost effective than printing on the cans. And especially right now with just the can industry being impossible to work with. Um, it's kind of a give and take there, but uh, we did we did have a lot of back and forth with the printers on these because um, it was just getting the color right when you're doing a when you're printing on film was just unreal. so the, one of the first things we got it was brown it was all the black areas were brown the gray was probably like a tealish blue it was weird but we got it we got it there. So. So with the shrink sleeves, the vendor we worked with for this one was kind of a nightmare. Um, didn't like them that much. But the new vendor we work with is called CanSource. And they, they, they'll send us like pilot cans of the shrinks, the already shrunk on the can. And they'll send us like, ver like versions of it. So if we're doing like a transparency on the gold to get the can showing through, like we'll ask them for like 40%, 60%, and like 100%. So we can kind of see the difference in the metallic sheen. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. There was a, I made a little mistake at one point without having a, I missed an area of an opaque white. And you know, if you guys, I don't know if you guys know, but like you got to have white under when you're printing film. So there was a little, little patch somewhere where it was like a whole weird thing going on. I'm like, what's going on there? And I was blaming the printer, but. That was my fault. <laughs> Any other questions on this one? Yeah. So these all get, so the cans and the shrinks all get delivered to either the facility that makes this or um, I think what's cool about locally here is there's a lot of mobile canning trucks and they're just like semis that they have a canning line inside. So they all do it. We don't, we don't mess with that end of it because if we did, it would, we'd have to use like a heat gun and it wouldn't shrink properly. So the, the printers will usually shrink it for us. And so we'll see an already shrunk on. Anyone else? No? Okay. So I'm kind of circling back to this slide that we kind of st uh, started on. Um, and just kind of revisiting, stand out, stand for something, and details are everything. Um, as you saw in like a lot of these packages, we, we put a lot of time and effort into making it look just how we want and how we'd want it to see in stores. We don't want to put something out there where any of you guys go to the store and be like, oh, what is this label? This thing's hideous. We don't want that because we, we want you know, the client to be excited. We, we want to be excited when we go to stores. And so I think what's really cool about these three kind of phrases are that like this can apply to you guys right now if you guys are starting your personal brands or your portfolio, your resume. Um, this all applies. And you know, you might have the coolest resume, you might have the best looking portfolio and say you spell designer wrong or you spell print wrong. That's kind of like that one thing where they're like, oh shoot. This person can't really, uh, they can make awesome work, but if they can't pay attention to details, you know, some people might see that as a big thing, some people might not, but um, I learned that the hard way. There's, there was a lot of uh, spelling errors that I had because I didn't do spell check. Spell check everything you guys do. Um, I actually have to go to the printers with a spelling error, so that's a lot of money that I don't have to spend to fix. <laughs> so. Um, I'd say, yeah, just 
if anything from this presentation you guys can take away is these kind of three pillars. Um, obviously not going to be super easy to make this change like overnight, but it's just something to work on. And um, yeah, it, it works. When you kind of like focus on these things, these three things, um, people notice it, which I think will be good. And so that is it. That is the end of my talk. Um, I'll hang around. I think you guys have a little bit of time. I'll hang around outside or here. If anyone has any questions, pick them up with my brain. I got business cards if you guys want to email me or ask any questions. So, oh yes, thank you for saying that. <laughs> I almost forgot. So we are looking for a production designer intern position. Um, and I think it's kind of perfect in this room because you guys are learning about setting up print files and you guys know kind of the details that go into that. Um, so I'll give you the cards and always check our website and our career section because um, we will be posting that position soon. So get your skills ready. So you started, tell us a little bit about how you started with Anchors and Allies. Um, so I made up my own position. Uh, I was, when, when I started, there was just Sarah and Rachel. It was two of them. Um, I saw my friend that, my friend who was my, was roommates with my boss at the time, shared a post from Makers and Allies. I had no idea what Makers and Allies was. Um, but I knew Sarah because she spoke here when it was called International Print Week. Yeah, it was all GRC. <laughs> Um, and I saw her speak, and she had worked on a project for a brewery in Davis, where I grew up. And I was like, I know that place. I'm going to go talk to her. And nothing came out of that conversation. She was so busy. Um, I didn't hear back. Um, but I saw a post for, from Makers and Allies on Facebook hiring a senior designer. And it said, minimum two years design experience, blah, 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 all that stuff. And I was still a, probably a junior, and I'm like, hey, I'm going to email this person and say, I have zero experience. <laughs> I'm still in school. I have, I can make a portfolio. Um, you want to give me a job? And I didn't hear back for three months. And then finally I got like called in for an interview. And that's kind of how I started at Makers. Um, it's that kind of cliche of like, when people say like, just go for it. Sometimes it, sometimes something does happen, which I was kind of shocked about, but. It happened. It worked. So, so maybe sometimes make up your own position, and somebody might notice it. <laughs> but yeah, anybody have any other questions? Doesn't have to be design related. Could be about GRC. Yeah. How much of your GRC experience do you use on like daily basis? So, Print. I wish. Not that I didn't pay attention in classes. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, I, I pay attention all the time, but in, like, I never thought that I would be working with printers on Flexo or Gravier or uh, like just Litho Offset, all that. Um, and of course, we, we recently just did a project that printed Gravier overseas, and that was a challenge. Um, day to day, we always prep files for offset or digital or flexo for cases and we're using this every day and that's why I, I was mentioning that position we have because this is all fresh in your minds and so if you guys can like hold on to this like we use this every day and i kick myself in the butt for not paying attention more because we'll get asked questions and i'm like shoot i knew that was in that textbook we had <laughs> but I, I forgot it <laughs> so yes this stuff will come back if you choose to go into any print or packaging industry. Um, like I think my emails now are all from print vendors talking about inks and plates and all this. And I'm like, this is not what I signed up for. <laughs> <laughs> so a production intern wouldn't necessarily have to have a portfolio at this point. Nope. Yeah, if you, skills. yeah, because I think what we're trying to do at Makers is build a production team now, because right now all of our designers have been doing all the production work. And so we want to build a team that can
do all that. Yeah, so you don't need a, if you have a portfolio, that's awesome. But this is purely just on the knowledge that GRC offers, so, which is kind of rare. Cool. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, if there's no other questions, that is it for me. Thank you. <laughs>